Good afternoon from a very quiet, surprisingly peaceful, deer free, no hissing swans, slightly polar shoulder, can't do any university stuff, Peterborough. Oh, something to spoil the view or enhance it, whichever way you like, a train. I put out um, my Tales from the Riverbank the other day and I got a nice comment from Tony Quinn who said that he enjoyed listening to the stories reminiscing about my days in the ambulance service. So I thought oh, I'll put something together which will maybe describe what a day was like in the ambulance service just a standard day and then compare it to how it is now based on information given to me by uh, my colleagues that I left behind so what can I say when I first started back in 2011 I was what they call a relief ambulance crew so I was basically sent to many different ambulance stations in the area uh, St Neots, St Ives, Huntingdon, March, Peterborough and you got initially you didn't get paid your travel but then you got paid travel and we were basically having to add at least another hour each way on top of a 12 hour shift and maybe a night night time so that's 14 hours even if you finish on time so that were quite difficult and nobody really rely, uh, nobody really liked relief shifts because you just didn't know where you were and it took a toll on your body, it took a toll on your mind, sleep was horrendous but that's how it was in the start and out of my 10 years I did 4 years relief and then I eventually got what they call a line and that was a permanent crewmate on uh, regular hours, regular weeks, regular days off. That worked perfectly. Everybody wanted a line, but they were very hard to come by. And I was quite fortunate, so I'm happy with that. So, we used to turn up on a morning. Sorry, I've just realized there's a cat in a tree there. It's always in that same tree. We've missed the hissing swans there behind me. So you'd get up, go to work, you go into your locker room, get changed into your greens, uh, do a pat down to make sure all your pockets were full. You had your documentation, uh, importantly you had your pass, uh, radio clips on your belt, just the normal stuff. And that's when you your day started oh there's some uh, people coming so I'll stop here and I'll just get straight back to you well, kestrel in that tree excellent so then get changed try and look as smart and professional as possible polished boots so you look all right you'd make sure you had your snap box with your lunch in grab yourself a coffee and then you'd go out to look at the crew sheet and that was in the garage so you're just wondering who you're going to work with now like every job there's people that you enjoy working with and people that you clash with different characters it, that's just normal life so you'd look on the crew sheet and you would either have a big smile on your face or droopy shoulders but choose what that we are crewmate for the day so get on with it you were also allocated a particular truck a particular ambulance now myself and my best man Nigel paramedic Nigel there's one bogey truck that we never really got on it was a trauma truck 853 <gasps> When we were crewed together, we got 853, we knew we were going to have 
a testing day shall we say and I remember a run of four shifts Nigel was missing for the second one I think he had a shift off but we had a suicide on the Friday cardiac arrest on the Saturday respiratory arrest on the Sunday cardiac arrest on the Monday oh that was full on full on and that was all 853 couldn't make it up honestly so I was generally early in I was always an early riser into work early ever since I was an apprentice mainly because the vehicles that took me into work were always breaking down so I needed that extra buffer of time so I wasn't letting anybody down some of the crews turned up at one minute to shift start and that used to really annoy me thinking I'm trying to get all this uh, equipment tested you had to test your shock box your defibrillator make sure you had full tanks of oxygen tanks of entonux gas and air make sure all your drugs were in order signed out and locked away within the ambulance you make sure your your cot your stretcher was all clean and tidy and what we call dressed for the first patient and uh, you then wait for your crewmate so in the case of myself and Nigel uh, Nigel young family and uh, although he wasn't late in he knew that I was going to be in and the vehicle was sorted so he had quite a bit of flexibility with his time and on the plus side when we'd finished I used to just basically jump off the vehicle and go home and uh, Nigel bless him used to uh, tidy everything up restock put the drugs back sign everything in sign everything out so we all had eight digit personal ID numbers so we uh, used to get inside the truck and we had a system called CAD and it was a dual use computer and navigation system sat nav so you'd flip over to CAD sign yourself in put your hours in what hours you were supposed to be working put your eight digit code in and then press go that meant we were a vehicle that was ready to be utilized now back in the day we used to get a call from central control wishing us uh, a good day hope everything's all right for you general bit of banter just quite pleasant and that because of time constraints doesn't really happen now it's um, it's a shame because it was really nice we used to enjoy that and then we were allocated either a job or uh, we were sent to a standby point uh, what we used to call satellite points and they were dotted all over the city of Peterborough uh, so we could be in Whittlesey at the fire station, Stanground fire station, Dogsthorpe fire station um, Orton Northgate which was the last place to be occupied so we knew that if we got Orton Northgate everywhere else was full and that's where we used to wait on standby until we got a job extremely rare that that happens now because of the um, increase in jobs people are just demanding ambulances so basically when the crews now log on they're instantly got a job um, as I mentioned in the previous video uh, triage French word to mean to sort uh, once the jobs were triaged they used to go on what they called a stack and that stack was in descending order most important to least important and back in my day you used to go in there might be two or three jobs on the stack now there is a incredible amount on just overwhelming amount on the stack so you're straight out on a job anyway back in my day we'd go to a standby point 
get some tunes on. Uh, various people used to like bringing CDs in and we'd just play a selection of music that we enjoyed and just sat there waiting until we got a job or if one of us needed the toilet, it's generally me, weak bladder, you get to that age. And we used to ask for a rest stop, so you had to go to a fixed place where there was a toilet, there was cooking facilities, there was a well, microwave and a kettle. Uh, so we used to go there. So that was how your day started. So you've now got to picture the scene. We are sat waiting on standby and then you hear your personal radio go off, your colleague's personal radio goes off and if you sat in the vehicle the CAD springs to life. Computer aided dispatch just in case you didn't know. So you have then I think it was 45 seconds to accept that job by pressing a button on the touch sensitive screen and generally as soon as a job came in you were either sat on the throne you'd just put your hand around a nice mug of tea you'd just picked up a phone call from somebody and all hell breaks loose if you're in the crew room, everybody's checking their radios. Who's got that? Who's got that? Who's got that? So let's say, for instance, in this case, we got it. So there would be a driver and there would be an attendant. The attendant sat in the passenger seat, driver sat in the driving seat. And you would uh, you'd race off to your vehicle, jump in your seat. And if I were driving, start the vehicle up. Uh, my colleague would accept the job and then the job information would ping up. Now, ordinarily, there might not be sufficient information on that job, but it comes through anyway. And you might just get pain. And that's perhaps all the information that's been given to the dispatcher. So you've just got to be aware that sometimes it's a bit sketchy. People come in. Sorry about that. So I would, uh, I would then start the engine. My colleague would accept the job. He would then grab a, a clipboard from the dashboard and start jotting down some notes. Um, time we accepted the job, time we started turning our wheels, that sort of information. Um, the type of job and a very brief area where we were going to, just for our own personal documentation. He would then flick over to the sat nav, tell me the area that we were heading for and then flick back as more information comes through because every time more information comes through the CAD system pinged just to give you an audible warning that there is more information. So you would then look at the category of the job. Category one and two was requiring uh, lights and sirens. Three and below was uh, running cold. So you didn't make any noise, you just toddled off um, one of the things you should know is the exemptions uh, when you're on blue lights is at 20 mile an hour you can go at 30 and at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 you can go 20 mile an hour over that limit because you are displaying lights and sirens. And just a further note, uh, you're not at liberty to move out of the way if we come screaming up behind you but it's very very appreciative if you just pulled over to the left and allowed us to pass and then you carry on your journey um, so what you mustn't do is start making erratic movements with your car albeit trying your best to do something to help us because we won't understand basically indicate left 
pulling left and we can get by anyway that's a just a little by note so what sometimes happened when you are screaming towards a job is that the job gets a lower grade or it gets cancelled so you will get your radio going off uh, we've got a vehicle radio so you can answer through the vehicle radio and basically like an indicator stalk at the side of the steering wheel with a yellow button I can press that and talk to dispatch so we would thought somebody was sneaking up behind me then so we would um, talk to dispatch if I was driving or my colleague could do it so if the category got reduced from a 1 to a 2 or 2 to a 3 if it went 2 to 3 it means we went silent turned the blues off and went at normal road speeds obeying the law sometimes the job was cancelled and a big grey square would pop up on the screen saying stand down which basically whatever you were doing you just slowed down normal road speeds and turn round and go back to where you came from or the dispatcher would allocate you with another standby point but now more often than not as soon as you get a job you'll get to that job some jobs in the nicest possible way were just even before you got there you thought this is this doesn't need an ambulance no chance other jobs you thought to yourself yes this did need an ambulance but it's a fairly easy bread and butter job what we could call a stay and play so there were no rush clearly this person needed hospital treatment but not flat out panic and then there were those jobs that popped up paediatric cardiac arrest drowning hanging stabbing fights which meant that there could be anything and everything going on at that moment in time so that's where you were um, your ears pricked up and you were right on the ball so when you found out what the job was you then agreed with your colleague what he or she wanted to do and what he or she wanted you to do in order for the crew to work efficiently as possible now I'd say 90% of the time that worked great some people had really weird ways of working not detrimental ways but just odd ways of working and I found that difficult sometimes but anyway you would get to a job and you'd either stay and play sometimes you were offered a cup of tea which was nice a piece of cake which was an absolute bonus sometimes you would um, get there and you think we need to load and go this is a bad job there could be um, blood everywhere broken limbs um, chemical spillages fires water ingress through in a ditch we'd also get constant updates from dispatch if they were sending or allocating further resources so if they've got a multiple RTC road traffic collision and there was maybe five or six people being reported as injured they would dispatch a further two ambulances if they were available maybe fire service if somebody needed cutting out of a vehicle police yeah absolutely um, to look after the traffic conditions and despite what you might think about the police they're a good bunch of girls and boys you're always going to get a bad apple always going to get a bad apple don't matter who you work for but they were rock solid they got my backside out, backside out of some sticky situations more times than I could mention fire service awesome absolutely awesome and when you got all three working together plus the helicopter it was just a joy to see and a joy to be involved so very proud of that I always liked working with multi-services 
and we got some proper jobs. None that I can really mention on here, but proper jobs. Anyway, that's a little bit more. So when you're at scene, if it's a real big trauma job, you could be there quite some time trying to get people out of vehicles. If you were at stay and play, you could either, or in some, some cases, you didn't have to take them to hospital, but they did need ongoing care. Might be a trip to the uh, walking centre, might be as simple as a call from the doctor. So we would arrange with um, the patient what they would like to do. And that was generally the doctor. So once we'd agreed with the patient that they were going to have the doctor, we would finish the appropriate paperwork and we used to call that safety netting so making sure that the patient was safe where they are correct documentation correct cor well, how do you say correct in, in English so the correct pathway for ongoing care and then we used to leave get back in the vehicle and have a bite to eat if necessary quick drink if necessary and then green up and green up just means ready for another job so that was the standard format of the day job to job to job halfway through the day you would swap over and you would attend for half the shift and he or she would then drive for half the shift so one word of caution no such thing as an ambulance driver. Oh, don't ever say ambulance driver. Ambulance crew is the correct terminology. You're not likely to get any gold stars if you say ambulance driver. Oh, heading back home now. So, we were then told by dispatch in the morning what time our dinner break was and we would get told stand down break time and we would go to the nearest uh, standby point in order to get refreshments, toilet, cooking facilities to keep everybody happy. Sometimes however you went job to job to job and stand downs in between you ended up further and further away from what was our city, Peterborough. I've ended up in London, I've ended up in West Suffolk, North Norfolk, Birmingham, absolutely miles away. Positives, they couldn't allocate you a job because you was out of area, you were in somebody else's area, be it West Midlands, East Midlands, you were. You, you, you couldn't take a job. Negatives, you were miles away from home and your shift might have already finished and you might have a two hour drive to get back because you were coming back under normal road speeds. <coughs> Late to bed, stuffing food down, upset stomach, you name it, we got it. Get back to you.